Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Novel Rapid Diagnostics for Sepsis-Causing Infections, Clinical Utility and Routine Application in U.S. Hospitals. This webinar is hosted by T2 Biosystems, makers of T2 Direct Diagnostics, a suite of FDA-cleared CE-marked tests that rapidly identify the most common and clinically relevant pathogenic directly from whole blood without the weight of blood culture. Chris Brain, commercial manager for UK, will be moderating the event. But first, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Now, I will hand it over to Chris Brain, Manager for the UK. Great, thank you very much, Elke, and thank you very much for everybody taking time out of a busy clinical duties to, to call into this webinar. Um, this is going to have less commercial focus. The whole priority of today was really Dr. Estrada and Dr. Clancy to share their clinic experiences with the, uh, the T2 system. Just to give a little bit of background on Dr. Estrada and Dr. Clancy, so Sandy's the Vice President of Medical Affairs for T2 Biosystems. She's also currently the President of the Florida Society of Health Systems Pharmacists. She was previously the Infectious Disease Clinical Pharmacist for Lee Health in Fort Myers for 13 years, where she served as the co-director of antimicrobial stewardship and director of the Infectious Disease Pharmacy Residency Program. In that role, Dr. Estrada led the adoption, implementation, and utilization of the T2 system, and has actually published results on improved patient care and reduced hospital costs. Dr. Clancy is a physician and researcher with an expertise in infectious diseases. He's a tenured associate professor of medicine and director of the XDR pathogen lab at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Clancy conducts collaborative clinical, translational and laboratory research on issues relevant to the treatment, diagnosis and prevention of infections in immunosuppressed and critically ill patient populations. His research laboratory is funded by the National Institute of Health, US Department of Veteran Affairs, and industry sources. Dr. Clancy has published over 170 papers in medical journals and is the editor of the American Society for Microbiology's Candida and Candidiasis textbooks. So without any further ado, I'd just like to hand over to Dr. Estrada, who's going to take the, take the ball now. Thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone for attending today. As we all know, sepsis is a major concern that we all deal with in the hospital setting, taking care of our patients with an overall rate in the hospitalized population of 6%, with 16% of these developing septic shock and 55% requiring ICU level care. The overall hospital mortality is 15% for sepsis, with the mortality being even higher in the percentage of patients that are diagnosed after hospitalization compared to those who are admitted with sepsis. Due to these high mortality rates and concerns, the recommendation has been made by the Surviving Sepsis Campaign that administration of IV antimicrobials be initiated as soon as possible after recognition and within one hour for both sepsis and septic shock patients. The recommendation is that empiric broad-spectrum therapy with one or more antimicrobials be utilized that will be likely to cover all of the common causative pathogens. This is because we know that time to appropriate therapy impacts survival. So in the now famous study from Kumar and colleagues published in 2006, it was found that for every hour of delay in time to appropriate therapy in patients with septic shock, survival decreases by 7.6%. 
In another study, the relative odds of death increased by 4% in patients with bacteremia, even if they weren't necessarily septic or had not progressed to sepsis at that point in time. However, reducing time to effective therapy has been shown to resu result in not only decrease in mortality, but also decrease in hospital length of stay. So for all of these reasons, the appropriate and rapid delivery of targeted antibiotics is critical for surviving sepsis. When we think about the process that we follow in the hospital setting and how we treat these patients, once we accomplish that initial getting broad spectrum antibiotics on board within the first hour, then we face the real challenges from an antimicrobial stewardship standpoint. And that challenge is getting the information that we need to be able to appropriately influence therapy. So we know that approximately 50 to 70% of patients who have a blood culture drawn will receive antibiotics and that this, this antibiotic therapy is inappropriate in almost half of the patients that receive antibiotics. However, we also know that once we are able to identify the organism, the species identification, then the percentage of appropriate therapy has been shown to be greater than 90%. So in other words, once we know the causative pathogen, we can use our antibiogram to direct therapy and make sure that we choose the appropriate therapy for the patient. So if you can follow along on the slide, what we see is that the patient is admitted, the blood culture is drawn, it's incubated in the lab. Somewhere between one to two days, usually after admission, we may get a gram stain if that blood culture is in fact positive. Following the gram stain another day or two after that, we get a species ID, so we're generally up to about 72 hours or three days in at that point. And then after that time, we may have additional antimicrobial susceptibility testing, and we may wait for additional blood cultures, especially if that initial blood culture was negative, then additional blood cultures will be drawn and we'll be waiting for those results. Looking then along the top on the same time frame, from an antibiotic standpoint, the patient re remains on empiric therapy while we're waiting for those blood cultures. So that broad spectrum therapy that we started in the ER remains on board through day one, day two. By day three, day four, we're starting to get information back uh, from the laboratory with regards to what the species is. And at that point in time, we can start changing our therapy to make sure that it's appropriate for our patient. Because of these delays in getting information back on what the pathogen is, and because of the concerns of overutilization of antibiotics, especially in the patient population suspected of sepsis, many institutions have decided to implement a variety of rapid diagnostic tests into their antimicrobial stewardship programs. And in some of the most effective stewardship programs, these tests have really become an integral tool for choosing effective therapy. Having rapid diagnosis empowers clinicians to make appropriate and timely changes to the patient care, leading to improved patient outcomes through optimization of antimicrobial use. So this would include decreased time to effective therapy, decreased time to optimal therapy, and eventually cost savings from antimicrobial use, as well as a reduction of length of stay associated costs. So now let's see where T2 direct diagnostics can come into the picture. Right now, T2 is the only FDA cleared direct from blood test for bloodstream infections, having both FDA clearance in the United States as well as CE Mark in the EU. And it is a test that can be used in the routine clinical laboratory with a fully automated T2MR detection process, giving you a sample to answer result. What does that mean as a clinician? It means that a 4ML sample is drawn, it is placed into our instrument, all of the technology happens behind the scenes, and three to five hours later, a species identification is provided independent of blood culture. So let's look at that from a slightly different perspective. First of all, on the screen, you can see what the instrument looks like. It is able to detect pathogens as low as one colony forming unit per ml. It is an easy to operate instrument in the laboratory with minimal hands-on time, and it detects 
the six most common escape pathogens you can see listed on the screen, as well as the five most common teach, uh, candida pathogens listed on the screen as well, with an average sensitivity of 91.1% and specificity of 99.4% for candida and 95.8% sensitivity, 98.1% specificity for T2 bacteria. Looking more specifically at these pathogens that T2 bacteria can detect, as I mentioned, these are known as the escape pathogens, which are concerning due to their ability to develop resistance and not be appropriately treated by empiric antibiotic therapy. Our panel covers about 90% of bloodstream infections caused by these escape pathogens, and T2 bacteria covers about 50 to 70% of all bacterial bloodstream infections, depending on the local epidemiology in your hospital. You can see on the slide some facts about the various escape pathogens on our panel and why they are of so much concern to us as clinicians. First of all, Enterococcus faecium with a 60% resistance rate to vancomycin, which is commonly used in empiric therapy. If Enterococcus faecium is found, then an escalation to a different gram-positive agent may be necessary. Staph aureus as the most common cause of bacteremia with a five times higher risk of in-hospital death is very important not only to identify, but to identify quickly so that appropriate therapy can be managed. And then looking at the gram-negative pathogens on our panel, all with high rates of attributable mortality and varying resistance rates to common antimicrobials that we utilize, such as ceftriaxone, cephalosporins, and carbapenems. So now let's come back to kind of where we are today and where T2 fits into that current equation. So we already mentioned right now a patient shows up in the emergency department or perhaps in your ICU. They're suspected of having bacteremia or sepsis. Blood is collected for blood culture. It goes to the lab. We wait, as we discussed, about one to five days to be able to get a beginning result on that patient. And then one to 48 hours later, we are able to get species identification. Your facility may be using some other technologies that are available, PCR, MALDI, film array-based technologies to identify these organisms rapidly. And the key point to note there is that these identification methods are dependent on the blood culture being positive. So again, waiting that one to five days on average two to three most of the time. And dependent on the fact that blood cultures on the first set tend to be about 50 to 65% sensitive. So many times in the clinical world, we're faced with a patient with culture negative sepsis where we know they're ill, but we're never actually able to get a positive blood culture. And therefore we're never, never able to actually get a species identification to direct therapy. If we contrast that to the top line on our graphic, we can see now we're able to draw the blood directly from the patient, place it on the T2DX instrument, and now three to five hours later, with greater than 90% sensitivity, we are able to identify the species of the pathogen causing our infection, which can then enable targeted therapy. So if we take a look at that, what we talked about before, now instead of waiting one to two days to get a gram stain, another one to two days to get a species ID and then resistance ID and maintaining a patient on empiric therapy for that whole time, with adding T2MR-based tests into that result, we are now able to think about species-directed therapy on the first day of the patient's hospitalization. In our experience with T2 direct diagnostics so far, we've seen proven performance in being able to impact clinical outcomes for our patients. Specifically, just some high-level information from some of our published work before we move into our specific experiences. We've seen proven time to results days faster than blood culture-based methods for patients with candidemia, uh, looking at five hours versus 72 hours. 
This resulted in an eightfold reduction in time to appropriate therapy, five hours versus 44 hours, meeting the desired five, approximate five hour time to result that a survey of infectious diseases practitioners stated would be beneficial to get patients on appropriate therapy. In more than five independent studies covering more than 300 confirmed infections, we have confirmed a proven clinical sensitivity of 90 to 100 percent for these bacterial and fungal pathogens, and we've also proven a clinical specificity of 98.5 percent from studies covering over 3,000 patients across more than 15 institutions, giving practitioners the confidence that with an estimated negative predictive value of 99% and positive predictive value of 33 to 92%, depending on the population, we can actually impact patients' antimicrobial and antifungal therapy. Specifically addressing implementation of T2 Candida, one study from Henry Ford demonstrated a $2.3 million annualized hospital savings based on using T2 Candida in their high-risk patient population. The study, as well as another, was able to show a seven-day length of stay reduction in intensive care unit patients, and this is where these hospitalized patient savings are coming from. But in addition to length of stay reduction, we're also seeing pharmacy savings of $195 to $280 per tested patient across these multiple studies. Now I'd like to transition into sharing some clinical data, um, both from my own clinical experience using these products and then moving on to some of Dr. Clancy's experience as well. So as Chris mentioned, my previous institution, Lee Health, where I've practiced as an antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist for 13 years prior to joining T2, is a non-for-profit community hospital with a four acute care facilities um, in Florida. And in these facilities, we had the opportunity to evaluate the potential utility of the T2 bacteria panel in optimizing antimicrobial therapy for sepsis and guiding overall antimicrobial stewardship. The primary outcome of our study was time to organism identification using the T2 bacteria panel compared to blood culture. And our secondary outcomes were percent concordance of T2 bacteria with blood culture and the total number of potential antimicrobial stewardship interventions, including escalation and de-escalation opportunities. This was a single center prospective observational study as it was conducted before FDA clearance of the product and the product was RUO at the time. Patients were enrolled from the emergency department with informed consent from November of 2017 through March of 2018. They were enrolled in the study if they presented to the emergency department of Lee Memorial Hospital, one of our four facilities, and if they had suspected sepsis with a news score of seven or higher or one red score, or they could have a news score of five or higher with one red score if they were experiencing neutropenic fever. Considered patients were consulted and informed consent was obtained for enrollment, which was obtained by a protocol trained pharmacist at our facility. Blood samples for T2 bacteria and blood cultures were obtained concurrently and delivered to our on-site laboratory, and the results were interpreted by a protocol-trained pharmacist. The results supporting antibiotic de-escalation were recorded as potential interventions, but no adjustments were implemented as this was an observational study. At the end, 25 patients were enrolled in our study, two were excluded, and 23 patients were available for the final analysis. You can see the demographics of the patients here, mean age 65, about 50-50 male-female, 40% of the patients had recent antibiotic exposure, and the mean new score was 9. The source of infection was variable, but in the majority of patients, the source was undefined at the time of patient presentation, although may have become defined later in the progress of the patient. Looking at our microbiologic results, there was a positive result on either blood culture or T2 in 11 patients for a total of 18 organisms. And we can see this better if we look at the next slide. 
representing what was found by T2 and what was found by blood culture. So where the two circles interact on the slide, we can see that four isolates of Staph aureus were identified by both T2 bacteria and blood culture, and one isolate of E. coli was identified by T2 bacteria as well as blood culture, giving us 100% agreement for bacteria that are included on the panel. Blood culture did identify four species of Staph and Strep, that are not included on the T2 bacteria panel. And then most interestingly, there were five additional pathogens, two Pseudomonas, one Acinetobacter, one Klebsiella, and one E. coli that were identified by T2 that were not identified by blood culture. And you can see in two of the patients that were polymicrobial infections identified by T2 where only one pathogen was detected by blood culture. Looking then at our stewardship intervention, there were a total of 36 opportunities for de-escalation identified. And the way that the de-escalation opportunities were analyzed was each patient was assessed for could Staph aureus coverage be de-escalated if Staph aureus was not present, and could Pseudomonas coverage be de-escalated if Pseudomonas was not present. Each patient was analyzed based on their history, the source of sepsis, the antibiotic history, and the local antibiogram information to make decisions about what changes could potentially be made on these antibiotics. To give an example, I will share with you two cases from the study. The first was an 84-year-old male who presented with a history of diabetes, prostate cancer, and end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis. The patient was experiencing chills during dialysis, had not been feeling well for about a week, um, came in, was found to have a fever of 101.7, a lactic acid of 3.2, and urinalysis was negative. This patient was empirically started on vancomycin and piperacillin tazobactam. Blood culture was positive for Staph aureus on day three, at which point piperacillin tazobactam was discontinued based on the blood culture result. In analyzing the T2 bacteria result, T2 bacteria was positive for Staph aureus, which would have accelerated the clinical care for this patient, allowing piperacillin and tazobactam to be discontinued two days earlier on day one. And the Staph aureus positive confirmed that the vancomycin was the appropriate treatment for the patient. Second patient is a 53-year-old immunocompromised, morbidly obese female with a recent history of surgery to drain an intra-abdominal abscess, had done well, but presented back to the emergency department eight days postoperatively with fever, chills, and abdominal pain. She was started on linazolid and astrianam as well as metronidazole for her infection. She had a penicillin allergy, which led to the choice of astrianam and metronidazole instead of piperacillin tazobactam, and linazolid was chosen due to difficulties dosing vancomycin in this patient. Her blood and urine cultures were both negative, so she remained on empiric IV antibiotic therapy for five days. She did well, clinically improved, and was transitioned to two days of oral antibiotics prior to discharge. On T2 bacteria, she resulted positive for E. coli and Pseudomonas and negative for Staph aureus, Ephasium, and Klebsiella, allowing for the decision to be made that this patient did not have MRSA based on negative Staph aureus and linazolid could have been considered for discontinuation after the first dose which would have resulted in a four and a half day reduction in linazolid utilization. And then more targeted gram negative coverage could have been provided to cover E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. In conclusion of this study, the T2 bacteria panel utilization at Lee Health allowed testing from whole blood samples and provided final results within four hours, detecting a greater number of pathogens, allowing treatment decisions on patients with otherwise culture negative sepsis, and numerous opportunities were identified for stewardship intervention secondary to the implementation of T2 bacteria in our institution. This time, I would like to transition the presentation to Dr. Clancy to share his clinical experience. Well, well thank you, Sandy. Uh, I'm Neil Clancy from the University of Pittsburgh, and I'll talk a bit about our experience with both T2 candida and now more recently T2 bacteria, and uh, talk about uh, clinical applications uh, of the test. So Sa Sandy reviewed the performance of T2 candida and T2 bacteria. I'll just point out that there are two multi-center prospective uh, clinical trials that have been published in clinical infectious diseases, looking at the T2 candida panel, the sensitivity and specificity of 90 and 99% that Sandy alluded to, 
Uh, but sort of the key result, I think, out of uh, the second study, Direct 2, was patients were enrolled who were known to have positive blood cultures. And then subsequently, uh, a, blood, a blood culture and a T2 Candida sample were collected concurrently, um, generally 48 to 72 hours after the original positive diagnostic blood culture. So this is a cohort who we knew originally had candidemia. And it gave us an opportunity in the study to demonstrate that, in fact, the T2 Candida does identify patients who are known to have candida bloodstream infections who are missed by, in this case, the follow-up secondary blood culture. Um, so, uh, and the other thing that became apparent, I'm sorry about messing up the slides, uh, from this study is, in fact, that where T2 candida was detecting cases that were missed by blood culture, the biggest significant predictor of that was ongoing antifungal therapy. So the test had particular utility in patients who were already receiving antifungal agents. So if T2 candida is picking up cases that are missed by blood culture, what is the significance of these discordant results where you're getting a positive T2 or a positive blood culture when the other test is negative? So if we look at the outcomes at the University of Pittsburgh of the patients who were enrolled in the DIRECT2 study, if 48 to 72 hours after initial enrollment in the study, patients had either a positive T2 or a positive blood culture, or they had both T2 and blood culture positive, their mortality rates range from about 30 to 50%. In contrast, if the follow-up blood culture and T2 sample were negative in these patients, the mortality rate was only 5%. So in fact, there is biologic significance to a discordant T2 positive blood culture negative result, and this is an indicator of bad outcome, uh, suggesting that at least some of those patients truly did have unrecognized candidemia. Just to point out that the T2 bacteria data have been presented at ECMID, um, and there's a manuscript currently under review at the Annals of, Infection, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine. But again, sensitivity and specificity overall, remarkably similar to what was seen with the T2 candida assay for the targeted pathogens on the T2 bacteria panel, sensitivity overall of about 90%. And if we look at specificity for proven probable or proven probable possible bloodstream infections, on the order of about 94, 95%. And once again, um, T2 bacteria in the upcoming uh, data that's gonna be published identifies a large number of people who would be missed if blood cultures were used exclusively. And the biggest predictor of patients who you will identify by T2 bacteria with negative blood cultures were those patients who were receiving uh, antibiotics at the time of testing. So Sandy presented some cases. Let me present a, a not a typical case from, from Pittsburgh. This is a 27-year-old double lung transplant recipient. He's getting immunosuppression. Uh, he, he also has uh, 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 renal failure for which he gets hemodialysis. He develops fever and leukocytosis during hemodialysis. Um, he's got a history of other line-associated infections uh, due to enterococcus fecium, ESBL-producing E. coli, candida vibrata, and staph aureus. Uh, over the preceding uh, uh, months and years, and he had just been discharged from hospital five days previously to complete treatment for an E. coli uh, bacteremia, uh, and he had a tunnel catheter that was removed at that time, and he was receiving ciprofloxacin via a PICC line. He was on day 13 of a planned 14-day course of treatment when he developed the, the fever and leukocytosis. So uh, he was admitted to hospital, vancomycin and meropenem, uh, were started initially empirically, given the fast pathogens that he had, had cultured. Uh, shortly after admission, he developed hypertension, requiring pressors. He went to respiratory failure, uh, ended up on mechanical ventilation and in the ICU in septic shock. At this point, two hours after being transferred to the unit, mycofungin uh, was initiated, and a T2 candida test uh, was collected four hours after the initiation of mycofungin and it came back four and a half hours later as positive for candida albicans and tropicalis. So, you know, the question then is, given that you've got a, a positive T2 candida test, at this point you have no blood culture data, what is the likelihood uh, that our patient has candidemia? And I'll, I'll give you a second or two to, to think about what you think uh, the positive predictive value of the T2 candida in this setting might be. 
But I think that gets at sort of the crux of using T2 can to the T2 bacteria, or for that matter, any of these new non-culture diagnostics that'll be coming down the pike, because these are not definitive diagnostic tests. They're tests that are gonna assign you a likelihood of disease, and the positive and negative predictive value of the test is gonna be shaped by the sensitivity and specificity that Sandy cited and that I've referred to from the clinical trials, but then the pretest likelihood of the disease in the patient whom you're doing the testing is. And one thing that's quite nice about candidemia and candidiasis is it's actually a large body of literature that over the years has assigned prevalence of the disease in well-described risk factor uh, populations. So, for example, if you look at the direct one study uh, that was done for T2 candida, in any patient who a blood culture is collected for any reason in this study, 0.4% of those were positive for a candida species that's detected by the T2 panel. And then the risk of candidemia actually increases as you, say, go into ICU and encounter patients with fever, or you start getting into the sepsis, septic shock, uh, patient population. And here with septic shock, for example, literature would suggest the likelihood is on the order of 3 to 10% of a positive candidate blood infection. Uh, and then there are various clinical prediction scores. In the U.S., we use the ostrowski leichner MSG score, but there are others out there. And generally speaking, those can assign about a 10% risk of candidemia. So then if you look at T2 candidate performance, and if you assume the test is going to perform as it did in the clinical trials, you can calculate then your positive and negative predictive values for different patient populations in whom you might use the testing. And what you see, of course, is that as pretest likelihood increases, your positive predictive value also increases. And then in the red box here, I've shown T2 Canada, but just for comparative purposes, I've shown a hypothetical PCR assay. And let's say this performed with 90% sensitivity and 90% specificity. What you can see is that there's a real step up in positive predictive values with the extra specificity that you get with the, the T2 assay. And in fact, sort of the fat part of your, your, your step up here is really in this ICU sepsis septic shock population, where you can go from say eight to 30% positive predictive values, or about 20% to 67% positive predictive values. Negative predictive values uh, for T2 candida and uh, hypothetical PCR assay, in fact, are excellent really in all the patient populations in, in, in whom you typically use the test, uh, you know, with values of 99% or, or greater. So if we return to our patient and we tally it up, you know, he's got fever, he's on hemodialysis, he's got thick line, he's getting broad spectrum antibiotics, he's got past candida infections and he's immunosuppressed. Uh, if we say this represents a 1% likelihood of candidemia, in fact, it's probably a little bit higher, but by the time he develops septic shock and in the ICU, he's probably got a 3 to 10% likelihood of candidemia. So if our T2 comes back positive, as it did in this case, the positive six value would be about 67%. In fact, he ends up fulfilling the prediction score uh, criteria for ostrowski Zeichner's MSG score, that would actually increase his likelihood uh, to about 80% of the positive T2 result. So uh, later on in, in the hospital, of course, the patient responded actually to his microfungin therapy. Uh, an ophthalmologic exam on day five showed retinitis. So we never had positive blood cultures. They remained negative, as did the pit line culture in this patient. However, with the ophthalmologic exam and everything else, uh, he almost certainly did have candidemia that was unrecognized by the blood cultures. So I think a key point here uh, in considering how you might uh, incorporate the T2 panel into patient care is what is the threshold then at which empiric therapy or therapy in the absence of a positive blood culture would justify it? In fact, we don't really know the answer to this. There's a large body of clinical trials done in uh, bone marrow transplant populations uh, and, and other populations dating back over the course of 20 years that would suggest that at a threshold of about 30 to 50, uh, 15 to 30% likelihood, antifungal therapy can prevent invasive fungal infections. Uh, so it suggests that a positive predictive value target is probably somewhere in that 30, 15 to 30% uh, window. And correspondingly, then a negative predictive value target would be greater than or equal to 85%. So if you think then how you might utilize a non-culture diagnostic like T2, uh, you're probably going to get your greatest utility then 
from where you go below that threshold, the free test likelihood, to above it with your uh, non-culture diagnostic test results. So let's go back to our table of various patient populations. So again, the lowest risk group, anyone you're going to collect a blood culture through your highest risk groups, for septic shock or for killing prediction criteria. And what you can see within the red box here for T2 Canada, if it's going to perform the way it has in clinical trials, within the red boxes are the situations in which you'll go from below that threshold of, of, of positivity that would justify therapy to above it. And you maintain negative predictive values that are excellent within this red box as well. So within this red box is probably your populations where T2 Canada would have the greatest utility. And you'll notice, again, sort of the fat part uh, of this box is right there with sepsis and septic shock in your ICU type patients. Uh, and if you compare it then to say a hypothetical PCR assay, what you see is among uh, sort of your non-septic ICU patients, T2 Canada, at least theoretically, offers benefit that you would not see with a regular PCR assay. And to highlight with beta glucan, for example, uh, where you're really not going to have utility in your patients with sepsis in the ICU the way you would have with uh, you know, T2 Canada. So I just want to point out, if we go back to our patient exercise here, and, and what we tell the, the, you know, the residents and the fellows all the time is, you actually don't have to do all this math. I think in managing an individual patient, a more impressionistic approach, provided you know who you're doing the test in and what you're testing for, works perfectly well. So in our case, you might have said, you know, I've got a patient with sepsis. I know he's at some degree of risk for candidemia. I've chosen to start microfungin. And when I get a positive test back, that justifies my decision to, to, to treat uh, him with the microfungin. Uh, conversely, let's say you had a patient like this, he's at risk for candidemia, but let's say we've gotten a negative test back and uh, we ended up then treating him with antibacterial agents and, and he, he got better and subsequently a bacterial culture came back as positive. Your negative test with the negative predictive value uh, that we would anticipate in the situation is sufficient to, to justify not treating him with antifungal agents. So, so long as you're using the test rationally and patient populations where the positive and negative predictive values would work, you don't actually have to go through those calculations. You can use an impressionistic, much in the way, say, a galactic man ant is used for aspergillosis diagnosis. So how can you incorporate these then into stewardship and, and rational patient care algorithms? And we've done is with our stewardship program, uh, we put together tests that in various patient populations use either a negative result to justify antifungal de-escalation or a positive result to, to justify uh, uh, prophylaxis or preemptive therapy. And the key to this, of course, is that the test still works in the face of antifungal therapy. So if you've started a patient, you can use test results uh, still to uh, interpret whether you're on the right course or not in terms of treating your patients. So just to show you, and I, I won't walk through all the details, but our, our first rollout was in our medical intensive care unit at the University of Pittsburgh. And we focused initially on our septic shock population within this uh, medical intensive care unit, and we set criteria. And we, you know, we knew what the, the baseline rate of disease in this population in the unit was. And then from there, you can calculate the various anticipated positive and negative predictive values, and you can put together uh, algorithms that use either the positive or the negative result to guide therapy. And we put this together with a joint effort between stewardship and a diagnostic stewardship team, which approves use of the test and helps teams with interpretation and treatment decisions uh, based on the test. So I'll talk uh, uh, just about the first 125 patients. We have more experience now, but the results have largely failed. So we had a 6% blood culture positivity rate in this MICU for one of the candida species that were on the T2 panel. T2 candida in this population was positive in 10% or 12 of the 125 initial patients. So if you look at either blood culture or T2 candida, we had a positive result in 12% of our patients. Um, and if we look at the cases that were identified by T2 that were not identified by blood culture, there were eight patients, or about 6% of the, of the cohort. So these are eight patients we would not have identified if we re relied solely on blood culture. And for another three patients that the blood culture did become positive, 
uh, we had the T2 result before the blood culture and we were able to guide therapy appropriately. So 11 out of 125 patients, or about 9% of patients actually had their treatment impacted where they got on antifungal therapy that they would not have received or were placed earlier on antifungal therapy by systematically using the T2 assay in conjunction with blood cultures. And if we look at the impact then on antifungal usage, be it uh, kinecandin usage or azole usage, we can see there was about a 50% reduction in antifungal consumption with the initiation of our pilot program. And the median duration of therapy for patients who are on an antifungal in this MICU was reduced from 26 uh, to 15 days. Uh, so significant cost savings and reduction in overall antifungal utilization. We're looking at the outcome data now. We certainly had no untoward effects from discontinuing antifungal therapy in the patients who have been discontinued. Uh, and we've now put together similar algorithms that are tailored for patients in our cardiothoracic intensive care unit, our trauma intensive care unit, which is where we see the high risk of abdominal surgery, patients who are at risk for candidiasis, and most recently we've moved into liver transplant. So I, I won't walk through these details, but if people have questions, they're free to con contact me at any point about them. But here, for example, is our pilot program in the cardiothoracic intensive care unit, really fo focusing on LVAD patients where we see a significant rate of candidiasis, and again, our various uh, calculations and interventions that are implemented by the diagnostic stewardship team. Uh, in the high-risk abdominal surgery patients in the trauma intensive care unit, the algorithm is a little more complicated, but again, everything is clearly spelled out in terms of criteria, what our anticipated results are going to be, and then protocols for uh, de-escalation or uh, initiation of antifungal therapy in given patients. So let me just shift for the last past couple minutes. We're now getting started really with T2 bacteria, which was just approved uh, FDA in the past year in the US. And we started by looking at the bloodstream microbiology at the University of Pittsburgh to get a sense of what's really happening. So about 60% of bloodstream pathogens are gram positive, about 30% at UPMC, 30 to 35% are, are gram negative pathogens. The breakdown of gram positive, staph aureus is number one. Uh, representing not quite 50% of, of, of pathogens recovered, uh, and then collect negative staph is number two. On the grab negative end, the big three are E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and Pseudomonas. So if you just look overall, 52% of all bacteria identified from the bloodstream culture at our center are on the T2 bacteria panel. If you look at the breakdown by gram positive and grab negative, about 50% of gram positive pathogens are on the panel. 63% of gram negative pathogens are on the panel. However, if you exclude coag negative staph, which is often a contaminant, 67% of what we deem to be real bloodstream infections, uh, in fact, were, were contained on the, on the panel. So we think for uh, real bloodstream infections at the University of Pittsburgh, about two thirds of the time pathogen will be on the T2 panel. If we dive in a bit deeper to gram negative sepsis and see when are patients actually presenting to our hospital with grab negative bloodstream infections. And the majority of them are coming in within the first 24 hours. So they either present uh, with signs and symptoms of a potential bloodstream infection, or within the first day in hospital, it becomes evident. Um, and if we look at where these patients are admitted, a lot of them are evident in the ED, and then in equal numbers sort of divided between the medicine floor and the ICU. So if we look at these early, within the first 24-hour presentations of gram negative, 71% of them are due to E. coli, Klebsiella, or Pseudomonas, uh, the agents that are on the U.S. version of the T2 bacteria panel. Acetobacter at this point is not on the U.S. version of the panel. And if we look at gram-positive bloodstream infections, and we exclude what we think are contaminant coag negative staph, about 80% of gram-positive organisms uh, within the first 24 hours of our hospital appear to be captured on the panel. So how are we doing and what are we doing with empiric therapy? And a major challenge at, at the University of Pittsburgh is we have high rates of drug resistance in general, but in particular multi-drug resistant gram negative pathogens. Over 15% of our E. coli or ESBL, 10 to 15% of the Klebsiella's are going to be KPC producers, and 10 to 15% of our Pseudomonas are going to be carbapenem resistant or multi-drug resistant. So with that, the empiric agents of choice uh, really are number one, Kerbacillin Tazobactam, uh, uh, and number two, Cepapine, followed then by carbapenems as number three. 
And overall, we're getting it right about a qu- uh, three quarters of the time. So about 25% of the time, the empiric regimen that we use turns out to be inactive against the gram-negative pathogen a patient eventually had. And part of that is, is the underlying resistance challenges that we face here, and guessing correctly in patients. And most patients then are also going to receive vancomycin as part of their empiric therapy as well. So the bulk of people are going to be on vanco plus pitbazo or vancomycin plus cefepime at our center. So how might C2 help bacteria help at our center? And the way we're thinking about it, we're going to take the diagnostic management and stewardship infrastructure we put together for Candida. We're going to devise unit and patient population uh, management strategies to exploit how the test should be performing. Uh, and we're going to focus on, within the first 24 hours, patients who either present or have evidence of sepsis. We talked about looking at the ED. We talked about looking at febrile neutropenia. But for logistics reasons, the populations that are going to be easiest for us to get started with are going to be our high-risk guys to use. And in Pittsburgh, with the large transplant programs, the transplant population. So that's where we're rolling the test out first. And we'll be implementing the algorithms that we're in the process of putting together. But here's some of the thinking about how the algorithm can be constructed. So, you know, if we look at our grant negative pathogens, we have a pretty good idea at the University of Pittsburgh who the high and low risk groups are for more extensively resistant E. coli, sub CL, and pseudomonas infections. And the empiric therapy then can be guided accordingly based on whether they're high or low risk for the more resistant uh, strains of these bacteria. And T2 then can help with either escalation or de escalation strategies in high or low risk cohorts. If you detect the pathogen, you can guide people therapy uh, uh, appropriately based on pathogen detection and, and patient risk factors. And as Sandy alluded to, well, we're putting uh, algorithms together to get people off of gram-negative, uh, gram-positive coverage. Uh, if they don't, for example, have staff and we're not worried about MRSA, uh, we can discontinue broad-spectrum gram-negative agents in people who we do detect a plausible gram-positive pathogen. And... Um, our basic tenant is that if you've got a T2 positive bacteria result and a blood culture negative result, if you're using it in a septic patient, the positive predictive value is justified considering that as a true positive and treating people accordingly. So in the last minute or so here, let's just go back to our case. Remember, he got uh, started on microfungin. All his blood cultures, as I mentioned, ended up being negative. Once the culture came back negative on day six, he actually stopped his vancomycin neuropenem. His microfungin had gotten switched to fluconazole after two weeks. He finished a six-week course. But this is a gentleman who really responded to microfungin and blood spectrum antibiotics within 72 hours. Let's say we had had the T2 bacteria, which we did not at the time this patient was here. If we had gotten that negative result on day one, and we know the patient's better within uh, the 72 hours, and uh, there's no evidence that he has a bacteria. In addition to the candidate, this is a case where I think we could have stopped patients earlier on the vancomycin and meropenem and spared the uh, extra broad spectrum uh, antibiotic exposure. There's quite a few cases like this uh, uh, at Pittsburgh where people stay on for five or six days until everyone's culture is negative. So, in conclusion, both the T2 candidate and T2 bacteria panels demonstrate excellent performance. Uh, remarkably similar for both tests with sensitivity of about 90%, specificity in the upper 90 uh, percentiles, and then exceptional negative predictive values if used in the appropriate patient populations. Both T2 candida and bacteria may shorten the time to appropriate antimicrobial therapy. I think you can identify for both of these tests high risk target populations in whom the test is likely to have the greatest utility. Negative results. Uh, to facilitate antimicrobial de-escalation strategies uh, for both T2 candida and T2 bacteria. And here's an example of some of the T2 bacteria uh, uh, programs that we're kind of kicking around right now. I think the key, though, at your center to optimize either of these tests is you've got to understand the microbiology and epidemiology of bloodstream infections, and most importantly, use the test judiciously with specific patient populations and predetermined objectives in mind. And I think if you do this in conjunction with an organized program of stewardship and diagnostic stewardship, you can effectuate results improving uh, treatment of your patients, but also more rationally and judiciously using antimicrobial agents. My final word, and we get this question a lot from our own clinicians, is, you know, you have a test that detects five escape pathogens, and these are very, very important. 
how do you use a text that detects five pathogens? And the knee-jerk reaction, I think, is to say that you prefer a broad non-culture diagnostic test, something that's going to detect hundreds of pathogens. And the advantage of this, of course, is you will detect more. But I think it's important to realize that the, the disadvantage of this is that you also increase your likelihood of false positives. And this is especially true for less common pathogens that may be on a panel and for common contaminants that may be on some you know, panel, such as coagulative staph. So the downside of a more narrow test, such as the T2 bacteria, T2 candidate approach, is that you're going to detect less than a panel that has 100 pathogens. However, you're going to eliminate many of your, your false positives. And you know, I think the question we'll have to figure out as a community going forward is, do we need a test that's going to detect the 50 most common cause of, of bloodstream infection? Or are the false positives that are going to come up from using these tests and detecting rare pathogens or detecting potential contaminants, is that going to outweigh the benefit from having these rapid test results? And I think that's an open question. But there are two very, very different approaches. Obviously, the T2 candidate, the T2 bacteria is a more narrow approach. Uh, and we'll just have to see how the clinical experience plays out. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and um, happy to, to handle any questions. And I'm also happy to answer any questions that people may want to send electronically by email or what have you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great presentation, Dr. Clancy and, uh, and Dr. Estrada as well. Uh, we've already begun receiving some some interesting questions, um, and I'd just like to open it up to these. If you can submit your questions by the uh, by the question panel, and then then we could actually put those to to Neil and Sandy. Um, Mark Wilkes up at Royal London was having um, some questions about the negative predictive value and confidence in having the negative predictive value there. I mean, do you have, I, I noticed you talked about doing that, that during your presentation, Dr. Clancy, but um, can you expand on that a little bit, about having confidence in the negative predictive value? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, is that what I could say? Hello? Hello? Hi, can you hear us, Dr. Clancy? Yeah, Chris, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I missed, I missed your question. It was just about having confidence in the negative predictive value and actually making clinical decisions based on that negative predictive value. Yes. Yeah. I think the key is is using the test in the in the, in the right clinical setting. Um, what we find is that uh, you know a, a, a worry we had with the protocols we put together is. Could you convince clinicians, even with a negative test, to stop antifungal treatment or antibacterial treatment? And what we found is that uh, we've actually had had good luck with it, uh, using it through the diagnostic stewardship team, where the team uh, taking care of a patient understands that the diagnostic stewardship team is authorizing the use of the test, is interpreting the test along with you, and is offering support in terms of guiding treatment. So the teams really aren't left alone or in their mind assuming full and sole responsibility for making a treatment decision based on the test result. So, you know, with the support that through a stewardship program you're able to offer, we found that uh, clinicians are quite willing to accept the negative predictive values and to discontinue antifungal, antibacterial treatment accordingly. I don't think what works is just publishing you know, say a little table and having teams look up, you know, positive and negative predictive values and then leave them all alone without support and, and help in terms of interpreting the results and making decisions based on results. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question about how can you justify the cost of the test? So did you, when you actually implemented this in your hospital, did you... Did you have to generate healthcare economic data? How long did that take to actually put together? I mean, the way we did it at, at, at Pitt, and, and we've got a fairly progressive leadership, we were able to, to go to them, and we were able to, uh, with the T2 Canada program, um, make a pitch on reduction in, in a can of Candon use. And we put together a scheme for what we thought 
uh, we would achieve in terms of number of patients and in terms of antifungal use. And in fact, our calculation was that this would be a break-even proposition, that we would stop enough antifungals to justify the use of, uh, of the test. Um, and it would also then improve patient care. So it's, it, it you know, was, was revenue neutral and it improved care. So with that, we were able to get the green light to start. And then we had to come back with metrics, of course, to the administration to show them how it was actually performing. Uh, we actually exceeded our projections a little bit. Um, and in fact, um, the, the reduction in the kidney candy use in the first year that we rolled it out exceeded the cost of the, of the testing. So we ended up a little bit in the black. Um, but, you know, at the University of Pittsburgh, particularly if you're talking high-risk transplant and, and uh, ICU patients, if you make a case that you're improving patient care, uh, it's not solely about the dollar and cents. So the dollar and cents worked out. Uh, and even worked out better than we thought it would. But from our perspective, the most important thing is we were doing a better job in terms of treating our patients, and we were doing a better job in terms of marshalling and being stewards of our antimicrobials. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And I know you talked about blood culture um, as being one of the other diagnostics using in conjunction. I mean, do you use any other CRP or PCT in the infected patients or ED patients together with the T2 diagnostic? Yeah, we, we generally don't at Pittsburgh. Uh, we haven't been, been great believers in those, those tests, but uh, at least theoretically, yeah, it's possible. I think the thing you have to be careful about with combining diagnostic tests is that they're extremely powerful if you get congruent results with both tests. And the way it works is your likelihood ratio with combination testing is basically the product of the individual likelihood ratios. So if they're both positive or both negative, this is extremely powerful. Where things become a bit more muddled is when you get mixed results. So if you get test one positive, test two negative, in a sense, the likelihood ratios cancel each other out and you kind of end up back where you started from. So I think putting tests together that complement each other in terms of where they're going to develop their false positivity or false negativity is potentially very, very powerful. But if you've got tests that are sort of at cross purposes as far as that goes, you run the risk with creating greater confusion by doing more tests than, than doing fewer tests. So we've not done the combination approach. And our combination, as you said, is a combination of culture with the T2 diagnostic. And I think that's a, that is an important point is that, uh, you know, any molecular test is not going to obviate the need for cultures. Cultures are always going to be, uh, give you information. And we always, with our protocols, as best we can, try to simultaneously collect cultures and teach you data and then use the data together. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. I uh, just have a couple of other questions come in from... Um, John Lamborn and Mark Wilkes up at the Royal London. So have you used the T2 diagnostic on any of the sample types? Uh, any, any use it where, Chris? I'm sorry. Any other sample types? So other than blood? No, no, we've not. We've used it solely on blood samples, um, just to approve on, on blood. Okay, fantastic. And then, uh, the other question was about E. coli being um, on the panel, and just to answer that, Mark, yes, it is on the on the BSI panel. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions around future targets and limited to other targets. So that's something that I'll, I can I can send over to the group afterwards from a marketing perspective. Um, just any other questions just coming through? Just going to see if just one second. Okay, well, I think I think that's pretty much it from the questions from from our side. I think some of the people are asking questions on the phone. I just need to speak to the organisers to see if we can open it up to the actual attendees to answer ask questions. Okay, well, I think that's pretty much it. So, from my side, so thank you again to our speakers and for everyone joining this this webinar. 
Um, if you've got any other questions, please contact me directly on my email. I think the majority of if you've got it. Um, also, once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey and a presentation that we'd greatly appreciate if you would just complete that um, for your feedback. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to actually view the recording of today's webinar. Um, I know that some of the people um, actually couldn't call into this are interested in the recording. Um, just one other question has just come in. Sorry, um, sorry, Neil. So, where do you see TT being the best value? So, the intensive care department or the emergency department? Uh, I, th I think it would work in in uh, in either, Chris. I think uh, your your sepsis septic shock population in the ICU, or if you have a mechanism for identifying and testing those patients in the ED, uh, I think it would work uh, uh, perfectly well in both those settings. A lot of it is having the logistics in place to identify patients timely in a timely fashion, get results, and get treatment decisions made in a timely fashion based on those results. But whether that's the ED or ICU, uh, probably works either way. Fantastic. Thank you, Neil. Um, and on behalf of T2 Biosystems and our presenters, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you.